Welcome to Zen Live this morning and happy Father's Day. Um, everybody's, well not everybody, my wife's still asleep so I'm alone down here this morning, which is usual the way it is, I get up early. And uh, I wanted to talk about, of course, Father's Day with, in a, with a wide angle lens instead of uh, our narrow focus lens, which is basically about our biological fathers and sons. Uh, yesterday, the metaphor in our toolbox was clean your plate. And we've been talking about the pain body and uh, cleaning the plate of the leftover negative emotions and grievances and pains, uh, learning how to clean the plate, not only of yesterday's grievances, but cleaning them as they go so you don't accumulate anymore. So let's... Uh, Let's move up to our metaphor for the day, and uh, ah, so we're going to talk about the pain body of the father and son. Now, first of all, uh, we're going to expand our understanding, get a bigger boat here. So, while we, while we're talking about biological fathers and sons, that is you and you as a father and you as a son. Everybody's got a father, you know. So, so we're really going, we're moving it out to a more a broader understanding so that the uh, basic historical, you know, ba the personal father and son then actually becomes uh, more like a metaphor that has deeper meaning in it, universal meaning. Uh, but interior meaning, not exterior meaning like how many fathers, you know, counting them and all that, you see. And the second thing is that when we expand the meaning of father and son, then son includes both father, both son and son and daughter, right? So we're, so we're not just, this is not just a gender-based uh, discussion. We're, we're going to try and pull this cotton ball out to some very larger understanding. So in order to get a grasp of the basic structure of this father-son relationship, we need to go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the infant. So the, so the child is born from the mother. And at first we all know, if you ever had an infant, that there is in the infant's subjective being, not objective, which means you're looking at it and as an it or an object, you know, but from the inside, from the, from the infant's uh, I am, there is no differentiate, differentiation between I and the mother. This is all well understood, that the infant is born with no self-differentiation. There is no I am aware of it. There is no... Uh, I, it. There is no awareness of. There is just awareness as. So the infant is aware of the breast or the mother as itself. There is no separation. And this is analogous to the Garden of Eden, of unity with the world. No differentiation. No sense of separation. No I in it. No I at all. Awareness as. And we all return to this all the time, but we don't realize it. When you go to a movie, you suspend disbelief. Now, suspending disbelief means that you suspend the awareness of yourself as a separate subject. Before the movie starts, you're aware of the person next to you. You might be looking around the movie theater and looking at this and that, or you're looking at the popcorn, or you're looking inside and thinking about, oh, did I turn the uh, stove off? Uh, or I hope this movie's good, or you're talking to your friend, and we're all a bunch of it's in there. And then the lights go down and the screen goes dark and the movie comes on. Now we begin to be, we suspend disbelief which is the differentiating mind. We suspend that and we become as the movie. 
we become the movie. We're aware as the movie. Unless somebody pokes you and then suddenly you're back into, wait a minute, I'm watching the movie here. Stop talking. But you can tell right there the difference between these two ways of being aware of the world. So there's the, and we want to get into the movie. We want to drop that separate sense of self. We want atonement with the movie. We want to be in it. Just like we want to go to sleep and be in a dream. There's, there's, there is rest ah, from the pain of separation. So let's get back to this. We're trying to bring several things together here. But, oh, I forgot to read the Tolly quote. <laughs> Excuse me. The energy, I've got this written on my, blog, on my uh, Facebook. The energy field of old but still very much alive emotion that lives in almost every human being is the pain body. The pain body, however, is not just an individual in nature, not just your pain body. It also partakes of the pain suffered by countless humans throughout the history of humanity. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of like narrowing this down to focus it on Father, Son, Father's Day, uh, because we can take this in many different directions. But the main idea here is that there is this all fathers and sons has a pain, has pain to it. Uh, every, just grievances, just inability. I know my, my whole life with my father was one of uh, pain because I never achieved atonement. Atonement means at one with. Now, we, uh, uh, Jesus is basically the, the cosmic metaphor for the father-son relationship. And oh, before we continue, we need to expand this word father to mean world and son to mean individual in the world. So you got, you got world as one, but you add a son, you got two. You get the idea? So the father-son, and remember I can include this with daughter, or you could substitute and say mother-daughter, father-son, but the basic, there is a, you see that line right there, there's a, there's a separation from them. And so there's a pain in separation. So the child, well, no, all right, so let's, let's jump back now. Hang in there with me. Now let's go back to the uh, basic foundation of our own consciousness. So we start out as the infant, aware as the world, as mother. So as the, for the infant consciousness, that is the consciousness that is prior to and primordial to our separate sense of self, you see, is identity with the mother. And the mother is a metaphor for the world. Body, being. The infant is one with being. And then gradually you can begin to show, and parents are right in there, uh, say daddy, say daddy, say mommy. No, daddy first. No, mommy, mommy. <laughs> they want the infant to see them as an object. And then once the infant gets that, once that sense of separation, that sense of there's an object and it has a name, and it has a name, then the infant child goes crazy. What's that? What's that? What's that? You see. And then it might even invent some names. I know uh, uh, my son used to call dandelions dancing lions. And we thought that was so cute. And I still remember it. <laughs> So he was. So the child can be. He'll learn the names, or he might create names. I was just at the uh, last night. We had the uh, 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 high school reunion for uh, my wife's class of 1957, and they all grew up in Blackstone. And it was commented there that when you grow up in a small town, everybody gets a nickname. So it's kind of like you have your given name, but the town, your peers, will give you, will create a name for you. And those are cherished names. Every, those take, you take it to the grave. 
You even get it on your tombstone. Or the newspapers, or particularly local newspapers, will always include the nickname. They'll say, uh, I don't have a nickname, but they'll be like uh, <laughs> Ed Skinny Conley or something like that. You know, so the nickname is always there. You know, it's kind of like a... Anyway, I digress. So, But the idea here is that we begin with oneness with the mother. The sense of separate self begins. And then when childhood is a stage of consciousness that is not unlike a movie. The, the child plays in the world as the world. But, you know, the child will create a play and be in the play as if you were in a movie. I, you know, growing up, uh, of course, all the movies when I was growing up was Roy Rogers, Gene Archery, and uh, you know, cowboys and Indians, you know, and so we all had little guns and we all played cowboys and Indians, but when we were at play, there was no difference between that and going to a movie. It, I was so aware as the play. And then, then the mother would call and say, it's time for dinner, and boom, you drop the play and you go running home to dinner. It's like leaving a movie. So anyway, the, the thing we're working with here is that there is a dance between, there is an evolution, uh, an evolution between being one with the world, one with the mother as an infant, which is being one with the breast, one with everything, and then gradually the differentiation of the self, and then the child goes into a world of play, which is oneness, and then he has to grow up. Damn. <laughs> and he has to leave his childish things there. He has to leave his play. He has to leave his teddy bears and his toy guns. And he has to become an adult and have real guns, you see, and live in a serious world as a separate self, you see. And who's the guide to take you into that world? Well, that's the father. So the father then enters into the child's, the, the child's oneness with the world, first as mother being, then as play in the world, and then the father becomes the threshold guardian, the guide, the instructor, uh, the, 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 the boot camp DA, or whatever the... Uh, <laughs> The military, you know, in other words, he's going to be either soft or hard. But his job is, is to take that child and go and move him through the threshold of childhood, adolescence, childhood to adolescence, adolescence to adulthood, you see. So the father shows the child how to function in the world and survive. Maybe get a job as an engineer, make a lot of money, and not just... Don't play the guitar. <laughs> don't don't be a don't don't be a guitar player. Uh, be a lawyer. <laughs> you see, uh, that's what I did. You know. So in other words, so there is this. The father then is a, uh, and I say threshold guardian because to the child in the world of play, the mother and play. You see, the father is like. <clears throat> He's standing there at the gate to the world. You got to go through me, kid. You see, you got to shape up. You got to get rid of that long hair. You got to get rid of that uh, those childish things. You got to get rid of that immaturity. You got to grow up. And if you don't grow up, I'm going to kick you out there. Do the John Wayne. You can't swim. Throw you in the lake. <laughs> so, you, you get the idea here that we're looking at the evolution of our consciousness from oneness with the mother, with play again, then separation. Now I'm a separate sense of, now I'm an adult, you see. I can't play anymore. Uh, I gotta get serious, get a job, get focused, get focused, have a goal, have a purpose. Uh, and yet now there's pain. So, the son 
daughters too. There is there is a uh, th there is there are two commandments of life that cannot be obeyed simultaneously at the same time. There is the commandment to let there be one. Okay, so this uh, is, is described as, uh, Freud would describe it as a yearning for infantile consciousness or a yearning to return to the mother and all that. Well, that's, that's just one way of looking at it. Or you would look at it mythologically and be uh, the yearning to return to paradise. In the religious context, you would say the yearning for the Garden of Eden. You see, when, when the separation consciousness was born, which was Adam and Eve disobeying the Father and eating the fruit of discernment, of, of differentiation, when they ate the apple, that created a separate sense of self, you see, which divides the world into good and evil, you know. That was a stage in the evolution. But it kicked them out of the oneness of the garden, you see. So now we're longing for that oneness because the commandment, let there be one, must be obeyed. Yet there's another contradictory commandment, which is, let me be unique. Or the one. You see the contradiction here? Let there be one means to be in as the movie. Ah, oh, there's no sense of me in the movie. I am the movie. Then somebody pokes me and says, you want some popcorn? Or it talks. And that breaks you out of there and breaks you into the sense of myself as unique. I'm now separate from the movie. I'm now uniquely separate from the other person from the whole place. I'm back in this little one little me that's separate from the world, you see. And I get pissed off. I want to get shut up. I want to go back to being one. Which basically is going back to being play and with the mother. The movie is play. We suspend disbelief that it's play, that it's not real rather, and pretend it's real. That's called play. Read a book. You suspend disbelief and you pretend the book is real. Watch a TV show. You suspend being the unique one that's separate, and if the TV show is good, you become one with the TV show. Particularly in laughter or horror. <laughs> These two elements will draw you in. Get that? When you laugh, you are one with what you're laughing at, with the world, and when you are uh, in a watching a horror movie and you, you ah, the ah, and the ha 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 is the same oneness. When you stop laughing or stop screaming, you're back as a unique separate self, you see. So I hope you get kind of like an idea this dance is going on all the time. But there is a fundamental pain body here, a fundamental pain to this intermediate stage in the evolution of our consciousness, which but for most is our whole life. That's why Buddha called, said life is suffering. This stage, there's no suffering here and there's no suffering here. We haven't got to that yet, but there is suffering here because it is the suffering of the inability to obey the two commandments of life, which is be one with life and be separate from life, both at the same time. You can't do it. Either one or the other. You either are a rebel or you obey. That's the choice offered to the son or the daughter. You be one with the one, you, you obey the father and try to look just like him or the mother. You try to, to, to obey, I'll be good, I'll be good, I'm going to follow in your footsteps. Everything dad did, I'm going to do. Everything mom did, I'm going to do. But at the same time, there's this yearning to be unique. Who am I? 
You see, who am I? I've got it. In order to be I, I have to be different from the Father. And then I want the Father to recognize my uniqueness. That was my dance with my Father. He never would re recognize or accept me as being unique. He wanted me to obey Him. He wanted me to be a clone of Him. He wanted me to be exactly like Him. And because I was trying to obey the uniqueness commandment instead of the be one with the Father commandment, there was a great pain of separation because every time I went home, I wanted him to say, oh, I accept you as your unique self. But he would say, no, no, you're not, you know. Are you you trying to convert me to something? <laughs> you're trying to make me agree with you? He said, no, you have to agree with me. Uh, so this, you can see this fundamental uh, angst in this relationship with either the father or the mother because of our inability to be one with the father-mother world and separate from it at the same time. So this then becomes our Zen cone. This then becomes the enigma of consciousness. This becomes the Gordian knot. This becomes the holy grail. This becomes the quest. All the myths and all the fairy tales are really based on this suffering and the desire to be, to transcend it or to be free from it, which in the Bible is described as atonement. And so uh, Jesus, you know, as the role, as the model for this whole dynamic, says, "I and the Father are one." Now, see, that has levels. I had one moment of atonement with my father. Out of my whole life with him. He was 94. He was in the hospital. Uh, I'm not sure he, but he was, uh, but he, he had a stroke, so he was not in his uh, old angry father self. He was more like uh, um, being there. He was just uh, compliant with, you know. And so when I walked into the hospital by myself one before my mother got there, and he saw me and he opened up his arms to me. Imagine that, opening up your arms. And with that nonverbal, with just that one nonverbal opening, he had never done that to me. He just opened up. And I just ran to him and hugged him. Atonement. And he said in my ear, I want to die. And in a couple of weeks, we took him home in hospice and he died. But just that one moment was the atonement that I had been yearning for my whole life with him. And that was enough. That was enough, you see. But that, um, um, so in other words, so when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, basically, and that, now we have to realize, now he's not, not talking, see, the problem we get with this is we say, well, is that, is God his, his physical daddy? Like my daddy is my daddy? You see, that, that's a very limited way of looking at it. I mean, you can look at it that way, but it has limitations. It's narrow. So when we expand the meaning, and Father means the world of, of existence that I'm in, you see, that's the, the Father. God the Father means all. God is all the totality. So God is all includes, includes the external world of objects and me as a separate sense of self, you see. So the all, the totality, if that's what God is, includes me and the world, me as separate from the world. But it includes it as one, you see. So that's the atonement I want. That's coming up to here, you see. So the whole drive of the evolution of consciousness is towards the transcendence of this, the pain of separation to become the one, which is atonement, in which the Father as the world and I are one. Which is going to a, like going to a movie, but this that's metaphorically speaking, but experientially the same. 
So when you go to a movie, you're one with the movie. You're at, at one moment with the movie as the world. The movie is a world. It could be a, a world of Egypt or whatever the movie is about, but it is a complete world. So when you suspend disbelief in this separate sun, you, send, you suspend the separate sun, and you become one with the movie, you are becoming one with the world. And it's a very nice place to be. That's why we got movies. <laughs> but uh, the problem with the movie atonement is that it's temporary. And of course, it's not real. So when we leave the movie and come back into the world, we're back into separation and the pain of separation. So the pain of separation with the father, with the pain of my separation with my physical father, who could not open his arms and welcome me, was the pain I felt about the world at large, which did not open up its arms and welcome me. We get all these little moments, you know, when you get, when all the lights are green, you say, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> Just little moments, teeny moments of atonement. When all the lights are green, everything is working, the money comes when it's, when it's needed, serendipity, things happen circumstantially but seem like they're planned. You're thinking of somebody and they walk in the door. All these little things are little flashes like flash bulbs of atonement when you are one with the world. And you can't believe it. You think it's a miracle. <laughs> or you thank God. Say, well, maybe he just remembered me. Just Maybe Daddy just remembered me just for this green light. <laughs> you see. But it's temporary. You can't hold it. So, so all of this pain, what Tolley's talking about here, this acute pain of this accumulated pain, you see. Tolley's talking about being the pain of Kant of humanity. This intermediate stage, the pain of evolution. This is a labor. The labor of birth to a new sense of self that is at atonement with the world, that is at rest with the world, that is at ease with the world, that is at home in the world. No matter what the world is doing, you're okay in it, you see? Not separated and a victim and why did that happen to me and I got to get back at that and restore a just Justice is a, phony, is a false way of atonement. Justice basically is restoring atonement. Atonement is zero. Atonement is balance. You and the world are one. Atonement means equal. No separation. No wobbles. No pain. No disagreement. No conflict. You see. So that's what we all yearn for. But Nobody can do it for it. Nobody can give birth to you. <laughs> you see, it's not like here. The mother gives birth to you. But here, this birth, we have to give birth to ourselves. Jesus can't do it. God can't do it. Uh, yoga can't do it. Zen can't do it. Buddha can't do it. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can give birth to you. You have to go through the labor of self-discovery and awareness. So this is what the whole practice of meditation, all of these talks and all that you see, uh, basically is becoming more conscious, becoming more aware, putting on a wide angle lens instead of a narrow focus, you see, which separates me from the world, you see. So this whole process of atonement is an evolutionary process, is a process of self-realization. Self-realization is self-birth birth back to one world where I can simultaneously be one with the world and be unique in the world. This is an evolutionary stage of consciousness that we're all going through collectively and individually. And like all labor, there's pain. And so totally Eckhart Tolle's talks 
are all about how to make the pain how to make the pain uh, dissolve how to make the uh, sense of separation dissolve this is Buddhism Buddha taught he said what do you teach he said well I just teach two things suffering and the cessation of suffering and that was what he did for 45 years. He mapped out the instructions or the laws of evolution that goes from separation to oneness. And then we have a lot of names for this oneness. You can call it enlightenment, awareness, awakening, salvation, self-realization, the self with a big S. Everybody's got a different name for it. Satori, Kinsho. Every religion has a name for it. And we have different names. Call it God, call it Yahweh, call it Allah, call the One, everything. Last night, or the other night, Friday night, we watched a movie. We, I have a little box of uh, uh, Cary Grant movies. And we watched, uh, there's five of them, and the one we watched uh, was the uh, Cary Grant movie um, Night and Day, but it was a kind of like a biography of Cole Porter. And of course all the it was an you know all of his songs were there. But I realized that these songs of Cole Porter because all the movie was about he was kind of like writing Tin Pan Alley, he, you know, before World War 1 he was a songwriter and a lot of the songs were you know the world songs of World War 1 and before in the 1890s and kind of Tin Pan Alley kind of yeah, rah rah, you know, and so uh, people were tired of that, and so he was trying to write songs uh, for that, and they kept rejected. Nobody wanted it, you know, and they kept the the uh, song producers kept saying, uh, "I want to feel the song. I don't want to think it. I want to feel it." In other words, they wanted to be aware as the song. They didn't want to sit there and listen to the song as a song. They wanted to be the song. They wanted to feel the song. And so we begin to write, and the one that comes to my mind right now is night and day. Night and day, you are the one. Now, what, what these romantic songs of Cole Porter in that age, these were metaphorical songs of a longing for the one. But they were metaphorical in that they were put in the context of a romantic story. So you're longing for the woman or the longing for the man as your beloved, you see. And you're listening to the song, night and day, you are the one, you see. But it's, it's put in a historical context or a biological context of you and some love affair, which has form. But the music is about the formless. The one is formless, you see. Here is form, and you're separated from it. The music are love poems to God. The music was love poems for the beloved. Now in the Middle Ages, there were troubadours who began to write love songs for some idealized woman, but they were all mystical love songs to God. And in the Middle Ages, St. John of the Cross and all these mystics, Christian mystics, were writing poetry, very sensual poetry, about mystical union with God but they were written in the context of a physical union. And the poets of Hafez and Rumi of the, uh, of the uh, uh, um, Islam were these writing poems to God in sensual terms. Cole Porter was doing that. So all of his love songs and all these love songs of that particular age, you see, were love songs to the one but they were metaphors in that they were pointing to the one and, point, and at the same time pointing to some woman or man. So you got both in the song and that was why we loved the songs because they made us feel one with the song. We felt the song in the heart and they just run in all the time. Still you remember it. Night and day you are the one da 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 you know, so let me be one and two at the same time. In the music, 
you are one with your own one in the music you are in atonement you are back you are at one with the world in the heart and at the same time you were separate because you were you were seeing the, the 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 song was about the one in which you have an atonement with or the physical person in which you have atonement with which is called romantic love romantic love is bam you're one with the other and all these love stories are about the pain of separation a love story is about the pain of separation of the two opposites coming together. They're coming together. They pull apart. They're back. And the tension goes. And at the end of the movie, oh, they're one and all. Oh, oneness forever after. You see? So anyway, I hope uh, we've expanded the father-son relationship a little bit here so that we can... Uh, perhaps understand the angst and the pain of our own father-son, mother-daughter relationships in a wider angle. And we can see the, uh, uh, the fact that it is an evolutionary stage that is pushing us, like on the pirate's plank. The pirate's plank is a metaphor for being pushed to the edge of your sense of separation or the known. You're pushed to the edge. There's, the, there's nothing there. And there's there's a, uh, somebody with a sword behind you. Go ahead, step off, step off. <laughs> Evolution is the pirate's sword, and the one is the end of the pirate's plank. Because we're afraid of the one. Because if there's the one, then who will I be? If I dissolve into the one, where will I be? Who, what about me? What about me, you see? So this sense of me, this sense of separate self, clings to its little self clings to its me. It doesn't want to be God. It doesn't want to be one with God. It wants to be, it wants to be unique. But evolution is pushing us towards being the one. So the leap here is a leap of faith that steps out. Faith that there is one. Faith that in the unknown there is one, and I'll be okay. Faith that, that's what okay feels like. Feels like there is one. When you have this feeling of atonement or oneness, you feel okay. I'm okay with the world. Even though the washing machine just blow up and I don't have any rent money, I'm okay. Even though I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, where the job's coming from, I'm okay. That's atonement. I'm okay. Even though I'm just getting divorced and all of this stuff, I'm okay. So be okay. <laughs> no matter what happens, be at one moment. Be okay. Thanks for dropping in on this Father's Day, and I'll see you this evening. <laughs>